Good evening and welcome to the 2016 Warren Gill Lecture. I'm Gordon Harris, CEO of SFU Community Trust, and one of three committee members who organized this lecture. The other two are Shondell Runka and Gord Price, and with considerable help from SFU City Programs uh, Coordinator Frank Pacello, who was standing here a minute ago. Thank you very much, Frank. I'd like to start the evening by acknowledging that we're on the uh, traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples. Also, I want to say that we're privileged this evening to have Dr. Michael Goldberg to deliver this year's Warren Gill Lecture. Previous uh, lecturers include Vitold Vrbchinsky, Mark Kingwell, Jennifer Keysmat, and James Ching. This annual lecture is one way we have to honor Dr. Warren Gill who dedicated his 33-year career to building Simon Fraser University's presence in this city and in this region. Warren died far too young in September 2010. Warren was passionate about many things, but especially about urban life, and his commitment to the city and region was unequaled. Warren was an urban geographer, a teacher, a university administrator, a musician, an eternal optimist, a lover of trains, cruise ships, and martinis. The building we're in tonight owes its existence to Warren's dedication to building a major downtown presence for Simon Fraser University. He was also involved in SFU's expansion to Surrey, and he also served for many years on the board of SFU Community Trust, playing a large role in the development of University City on Burnaby Mountain. But mostly, Warren was a good friend, someone we miss, and through this annual lecture, uh, his memory and his commitment to asking tough questions, to raising challenging issues, and invoking new ways of thinking about urban life can live on. Right now, before we get to the lecture itself, I would like to invite SFU Vice President of External Relations, Dr. Joanne Curry, to come up and make a very special announcement. Good evening. Many of us in the room have very fond memories of Warren, and I, I challenge anyone when we say the name Warren not to have a smile. Um, he had an incredible sense of humor, and more than anyone I know could just keep calm in the most chaotic situations. Uh, Gordon outlined his many accomplishments with the campuses, Vancouver campus, the Surrey campus. Um, I think a lot of his accomplishments were the relationships that he built with city governments, with private sector, with many others. Uh, he also was a mentor and supportive colleague to many, uh, many of us in the room and to me personally. And I'm so honored to be in the position that he held um, and, and was so capable at. And I'm also so pleased that uh, people like uh, former President Jack Laney and Michael Stevenson are in the room because what was accomplished was phenomenal in terms of building SFU's campuses. Tonight, I'm pleased to announce the creation of the Warren Gill Award for Community Impact. This award will be given annually to a deserving SFU faculty or staff member who demonstrates a significant contribution to, uh, with one of SFU's communities. The contribution could be in environmental, social, cultural areas, or economic. Uh, in many cases, the community partner will also be honored because in many cases, it is about the relationship. We're going to issue the first call on Monday, and um, the award submission deadline is January 31st, and we're looking forward to the next lecture in order to tell you uh, who won the award. I wanted to personally thank uh, Shondell for allowing us to honor Warren in this way, uh, in, in the hopes that uh, this is just one of the many ways that we keep his legacy alive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanne. That's wonderful news and a great way to start this evening. And just before I introduce Dr. Goldberg to you, I want to acknowledge and thank our sponsors, Bing Tom Architects, McCarthy Tetro, Polygon Homes, SFU Community Trust, and of course, Simon Fraser University. So Dr. Goldberg's agreed to take questions following his lecture, and as in past years, um, honoring Warren's devotion to students through his teaching and mentoring. Uh, I'm going to encourage students, 
early career professionals, members of the uh, public who don't always get a chance in a setting like this to stand up and ask questions. And so when we get to the Q&A, there will be uh, people with microphones on the stairs and just put your hand up to signal that you want to ask a question. <coughs> Excuse me. So Dr. Goldberg's academic and public career spans over 40 years, four decades. And from 2002 to 2004, he was the Associate Vice President International at the University of British Columbia and the H.R. Fullerton Professor of Urban Land Policy in UBC's Sauter School of Business, where he also served as the dean from 1991 to 1997. His research addresses cities, their transportation, housing, land use systems, and their competitive position in the global economy, and the policies needed to globally enhance their competitiveness. Mike Goldberg has a PhD in economics from the University of California at Berkeley. He has served on many boards, committees, and commissions over uh, many, many years. Notably, he's the past chair of the Surrey Center Development Corporation Board of Directors, and he's a past director of the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board. So ladies and gentlemen, please turn off your phones if you haven't already done so, and I just checked mine and it is off. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Goldberg. Well, I've got a clock up here in hundreds of a second. That's really good. <laughs> so to stick for the minute. Um, as the background for this, when uh, I was asked, uh, kindly by Gordon and uh, Trondell and, and Gordon Price to talk. Uh, I reflected on all the good times I had working uh, with Warren. Uh, we spent a lot of time working on the Great Northern Way uh, Trust, which SFU, UBC, Emily Carr, and uh, BCIT jointly owned. And uh, Warren was a real joy to, to work with uh, there. And uh, he was always fun. Joanne said, you can't mention more without having a smile on your face. So when Gordon asked me to do this, they sent me, this is what we expect you to do. And um, I hope I will raise questions and uh, not just live up to the, the letter of the intent, but also keep the spirit and, uh, and certainly in keeping with Warren's humor. So here we go. Um, Maybe I should start by telling you the titles we didn't go for in this. <laughs> um, Gordon, as he said, tried to rein me in a bit, but the original title I had, which he quickly vetoed, was Vancouver, a world-class city, and then I had two taglines. The first was, you've got to be kidding. And secondly, not by a long shot. So we, we made it a much more uh, civilized, and I will try to stick with that, but I know in questions, I'll get out of hand, which is not possible to stick to the knitting. Me and Mr. Trump have that in common. I hope that's the only thing we have in common. Um, what I want to look at the, is the regional context. And we, uh, in Vancouver, have a 50-year history uh, since the, the first regional plan, really, in, in 1968. Uh, there used to be something called the Lone Mainland Regional Planning Board, which went all the way out to Hope. And um, it was replaced in the late 60s by a series of regional districts which span the province. Uh, the one in, in Vancouver uh, was originally the Greater Vancouver Regional District, now called Metro. And the first plan for the region was in 1975, and it was uh, supported by a supplementary plan uh, on regional town centers. The idea was, and to this day, I think it's, uh, it's quite prescient when you realize that 40-odd uh, years later, um, we're still trying to live up to the tenets of that plan. The idea was there were a bunch of regional town centers. They'd be connected by transit. And uh, we would have growth around these centers, uh, leave room for agricultural land and open space in between the town centers. And that way, we preserve land and also create uh, or preserve the livability. And I think that what we've been trying to do ever since is fill in that plan. 
Uh, it was updated in 1989, and uh, then it was updated again with the, the regional uh, plan in 2011 called Shaping Our Future, uh, all building on this same idea. And I think the plan was terrific. Uh, the problem was, uh, for a number of reasons, we had trouble getting there. So let's see why. Does that do it? Yeah, OK. So first, we've been endowed with great natural beauty, and we've traded on that for a very long time. And I think we've traded too much on it. Uh, we've also had great planning, particularly at the, at the regional level, where we were, uh, I think, a real pathbreaker starting when we realized we had this regional planning board in 1961, and then formally the creation of regional districts. And there's been a huge commitment to maintaining and, uh, where possible, enhancing the environment. And I think we've, we've really done that over the nearly 50 years that I've lived here. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, for the young people in the audience who are doing this for a living in the future, there's a lot to be done to make this a really great uh, city. I think we have lots of the building blocks, and I think we have uh, many, many moons to go. Uh, the first, the future, one theme here is going to be that it lies in the past. So almost all the ideas we need are tried and true ideas, and I'll show some of them are hundreds of years old. And what I want to do is combine those with some other ideas about city building to see where we can take the city going forward. Now, we've had a number of successes, uh, and I think uh, particularly with this new transit-oriented development, TOD, uh, certainly places like Metrotown, as it's grown on both sides of the railroad tracks, Brentwood, uh, Surrey City Center, Coquitlam, uh, really have become, uh, I think, exemplars of, of how to do that. You notice Vancouver is not included in there, and that's on purpose. Uh, we've also been a pioneer in putting housing back in the central city and regenerating uh, life and not just having offices that close at 5 o'clock and the city is abandoned. So we've done a great job in Vancouver CBD, uh, Surrey City Center is a whole new city center which is taking shape and I think will be very different from Vancouver's and another model uh, that uh, people can follow. And places like New Westminster and, and Lower Lonsdale are also very compact city centers in their own way. Uh, creating parks, we've done uh, some notable work with the Cole Harbor and Falls Creek uh, the Spirit Trail, which will eventually link Deep Cove, Deep Cove uh, right across to Horseshoe Bay with one continuous uh, traffic-free uh, connector by the shore. Uh, we've also had some terrific success in raising densities. Uh, I was astounded to go through Port Moody just a couple of weeks ago and see the extent to which that place has densified. Uh, Lower Lonsdale, Metrotown, and of course Cole Harbor or all examples of rising density, and of the great degree of satisfaction people have living in those neighborhoods. That I know that continues is a big part of what I'm talking about. People continue to scream about density and height, and yet when people are given the opportunity to move into dense neighborhoods with high buildings, uh, they like it and they don't move. And the other successes we've had have been in transit. We've had four lines built, uh, starting with the original SkyTrain, which was eventually extended to Surrey, and then the Evergreen Line is the most recent one. In between, we've had the Canada Line to the airport and the, and the Millennium Line going out on low heat, plus the B-Line buses like the 99B. So we've done lots of really laudable things. Uh, what we haven't done, unfortunately, is uh, doing enough of them. So while we've done lots, we've, we've missed a lot of opportunities. And the transit infrastructure, which really is critical to all of this for a number of reasons, I'll get into shortly, uh, really badly lags. We've uh, drastically underinvested in transit, we've overinvested in roads, and we are going to pay the price going forward. The inability of, uh, the unwillingness of the province to fund uh, transit, I think, will cost the province significantly because without a healthy Vancouver metropolitan area, the health of the provincial economy is severely damaged. But there, are, well, that's an unpaid announcement. <laughs> but there'll be more of those later. As I said, my job now is better than tenure because before I just couldn't be fired. Now I don't work, <laughs> so I am really independent. 
Um, until the Canada Line, uh, there really was no focus on transit-oriented development in the city of Vancouver at all. Uh, ludicrously, the Canby uh, Line planning started the Canby study, which developed these six-story buildings along Canby Street, uh, started four months after the line was open, uh, really getting ahead of the power curve. <laughs> and um, we've really been imaginative. We've gone up to six stories along Canby Street where you're sitting on a ridge where you're not blocking anybody's view. That's hardly my idea of uh, transit-oriented development. Autos have dominated, and unfortunately, they're dominating more. When I read that people are planning on the planet, the province is planning on having a bridge link across House Sound to the Sunshine Coast for some 40,000 people. I mean, stupid is the first word that comes to mind, and other stronger ones follow. Um, it's just not where the future is and where the present is in many places. So we're only now starting to develop really robust complementary policies between transit and land use. So I mean, here are some pictures of the successes we've had. 99B is purported by uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers to be the busiest bus line in all of North America. And people who depend on it to get out to UBC uh, find it's very difficult to get on it. This is Georgia Street at rush hour. We've hardly had a great success. Uh, my wife and I moved to the North Shore uh, eight months ago, and we find it is impossible to get off the North Shore after 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Both bridges, Lionsgate and the second arrows, are absolutely packed. So the only way to get here is to take sea bus, which is a great alternative, but that's part of the reality. Now, I'm going to show my two favorites. My wife said you have to have these slides. My two favorite transit-oriented development slides, um, and these slag the city, which deserves to be slagged. Um, first. Uh, the most accessible point in Western Canada in terms of the number of people who can get there within 30 minutes. Commercial and Broadway. We have a Safeway, uh, Shoppers Drug Mart, and other one-story buildings. And uh, the plan the city has put forward sees uh, up to 24 stories built in this place. Uh, hardly a way to deal with either populating the transit system or getting much ahead of the supply curve for housing. Uh, number two on my favorite list of transit-oriented development is this one right here, Broadway and Canby, a one-story subway entrance across the street. There's a Wendy's in a parking lot, and then there's a two-story uh, Taqueria on the other side. So this is not where we need to go, particularly when you consider there's going to be a crossing subway underneath Broadway, and this is also going to be an extremely accessible place. So uh, we have done some things on transit-oriented development, particularly in the city of Vancouver, we lag badly. Now, my view, uh, having grown up in New York, gone to school in, in Berkeley, and lived in some reasonably exciting places, I think push comes to shove, our city is still reasonably dull and highly controlled. Uh, we have three big problems. Housing affordability we know about. Uh, matching it is traffic and transit congestion and the very modest prog progression we've had toward real uh, transit-oriented development. We put these three together and it's a triple whammy on affordability because affordability is both travel costs for households and occupancy costs. And the failure to put lots of housing on top of transit stations means that we fail to provide economical travel and economic housing in large quantities. Uh, we are still blessed in Vancouver with uh, wonderful neighborhoods. Uh, NIMBY is uh, part and parcel of the uh, founding principles of Dunbar ratepayers. And um, <laughs> they're getting into the 20th century slowly. And uh, when I understand there was a big fight on the Stone site to build a six-story building, and in the end they built a four-and-a-half-story building. Uh, four stories on the high part of the hill and five stories on the other half of the hill. This is a ridiculous waste of land, and when you realize that Dunbar is a reasonably dull community because it doesn't have enough density, that the interior of Dunbar is uh, largely single-family houses, many of which are vacant, uh, it explains that NIMBY is alive and well. We also benefit from something called NIMTY, which is not in my term of office. Um, courage <laughs> is uh, a very short supply in, uh, in the political sector and the ability to Democracy is a combination of listening and not listening. So you have to be a very subtle purveyor of followership and leadership. And leadership is shutting off a hearing aid 
and charging ahead. Uh, we have not done that in all too many places uh, and not done what's right. We've uh, taken the political low road and I'll certainly say the province excels at that. Uh, restaurants, great outdoor restaurants. And if you were the purveyor of railings in Vancouver, you're going to get very, very wealthy. Uh, so yes, we glory in the, in the outdoors, uh, particularly if we can wall them off. Uh, and then pedestrians need to be very careful, not just the bicycles and cars, but for a city that's dedicated to green, uh, we have no pedestrian streets, which I always find curious. So in sum, we've done a lot. And I don't want to denigrate that. I do want to point out that we can't sit on our laurels. We can't get smug, which we've been doing. And we have to look to the future. So what kinds of things can we do to have really vital and affordable and accessible cities? So there are three strategies I want to go over. The first one is we really need to energize the region. That anybody who's lived in a city of this size and other places knows that there's a lot more happening in a lot less structured way than seems to happen in Vancouver. So the three strategies I want to look at are energizing the urban region, uh, getting around our cities uh, with more certainty, uh, more economy, and more choices, and then looking at some innovations in land use, and particularly having flexibility. Uh, I'm going to illustrate these with lots of pictures, uh, save you listening to a thousand words per picture. So, We'll move ahead. Energizing the region. Uh, outdoor dining sidewalks, really a very popular in Vancouver. Uh, railings are also popular because the city requires them. I was stunned to find out from friends of mine who own restaurants that if you have an outdoor patio, you need a separate license. In addition to the license for your indoor restaurant, that's a great way to raise money. It's not a great way to raise activity levels. Uh, so outdoor dining is one of the things I think we really need to to back off on and let people have a little more chance to pull chairs out on sidewalks. Uh, activating our waterfronts. Uh, we lived in Pearl Harbor for 13 years, and Pearl Harbor Park is a wonderful place for grass. It's not all that interesting for people. So we need to activate the waterfronts and get some things happening there. And certainly having street fairs and street markets as year-round activities that people can depend on should be the new normal and not uh, something that's special. It should just be part of what we do. So outdoor dining and sidewalk cafes, Paris is always the one that's uh, put up for good reason, but any place in Europe, and even as you'll see in New York, it's the same thing. Notice no railings, people spill out onto the street. Some people may even be in the roadway, uh, God forbid. But uh, they seem to survive. Uh, here's one from uh, Buenos Aires, same thing, the city is littered with these cafes. And then my home city of New York, it's totally uh, beyond comprehension here that people spill onto the street, they have no respect for order, and they just seem to be having a hell of a good time. And um, I think we, we should really allow that kind of serendipity and energy to happen. Waterfronts. Um, we have beautiful waterfronts, but they really are dull. Uh, when I came here in 1968, the only access to the waterfront was to illegally wander onto piers B and C that uh, Canadian Pacific had and take a look. Uh, I remember when I moved here, you could get homes. Our first home we looked at was on Point Bray Road on the north side of the road, a 25-foot lot with an old bungalow from the 20s, $25,000. There was no premium put on view uh, or water access, and I think we still have that to, to some degree. Um, so here are some of the things we could do. If you look at uh, Riverwalk in San Antonio, a um, place we lived for uh, two and a half years, Singapore, one of the more controlled places on the face of the earth. They allow people to populate the waterfront, and um, London has done great work on the Thames and, and opened it up to people and activity. The Danes, of course, being libidinous, would allow this kind of activity, so we, we don't want to follow them necessarily, but they're having fun too, and hanging their legs over the water is clearly dangerous, violates some bylaw, but they're doing it anyway. <laughs> um, and even Baltimore, uh, one of the more challenged cities in the United States, has had enormous success with opening up its waterfront. The thing that's common in all these places, you have activities on the waterfront, not just grass. 
And the Parks Board in the city of Vancouver have been very loath to imagine that a place like Cold Harbor Park could actually have restaurants and interesting kinds of retail opportunities either uh, can't believe it out over the water or on floats. And all these cities allow that, and it certainly makes the places much more interesting and energized. Uh, street fairs. We, we have occasional street fairs. We celebrate them well beyond their worth uh, because there's so few of them. But here's one that takes place every week in London. It's a famous Petticoat Lane, um, one that's been going uh, since the 1890s in New York, Orchard Street, still going strong. They close the street and uh, merchants move their stuff out onto the street. Uh, a wonderful, famous street market in, uh, in Paris uh, that's open every day and you can wander down there and, and buy your provisions fresh every day. And uh, my favorite of all is the Feast of San Gennaro in Italy, in Little Italy in New York every September. And they just close the street and as you can see, mayhem breaks loose and people have a very good time. Um, even cities like Toronto have an open-air flea market, and even Long Beach, the home of auto-oriented Los Angeles, uh, still has stuff that has people engaged on the ground, outdoors, and enjoying the good weather. So I think there's a lot we can do to uh, enliven and make the city more diverse and more interesting in those ways. When I look at getting around the city um, and uh, making spaces more enjoyable, uh, one of the things that we have not done, and I'll get into this a little bit later, is we, we seem to have let uh, traditional old uh, design-oriented physical architectural planning uh, lapse, and we spend much more time uh, dealing with policy issues, zoning densities, and the like. So when I look at places like uh, New York as an example, but many other places where they have these mini parks, uh, pedestrian zones, uh, and huge spots of the city where you can walk. Uh, we have none of that here. Uh, the other thing in New York and here, uh, very long blocks downtown and in New York as well, and they have uh, all these blocks cut in half with buildings that go through uh, from one street to the other. In one case, these mid-block cuts go for six blocks, and I'll show you a picture of that. Um, urban waterways, pedestrian bike bridges, uh, we don't do any of that either in False Creek or out on the Fraser River. There are some little islands we can walk to. Don't do it in Steveston. There's no bridge across the Fraser from Queensboro that people can use, although there's some talk of getting one. Uh, commuter ferries. Um, I use the one commuter ferry we have, but if we remember in the old days, uh, I think up till 1958, there was actually a ferry that ran from Dunderay to Jericho. Uh, so this is not a new idea. It's getting an old idea to work better. And many cities thrive on that have lots of photos. Uh, we need to desperately extend Rail Rapid uh, to Surrey Langley, Broadway, and out to Port Quickham. Uh, that's a big ticket item, but it's a very cheap investment. And the quicker we make it, the more it's going to pay dividends. And then we have the real oldie but goodie trolley cars. They're coming back. And uh, of course, in this city, bikes. So pocket parks, the most famous of the pocket parks is Paley Park in New York, which is about 40 years old. It's a tiny little side to a big office building, uh, and it offers you a really wonderful uh, quiet and a uh, place to get coffee and generally relax in and take time out from a very busy city. And this is a very busy part of the city. It's right near the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, some other little parts. Uh, I hope this shames the city, but it never has. Uh, Regina. Uh, not one city we would normally think to emulate. Uh, it's got a mall, and quite a successful one. Uh, the Spark Street Mall in Ottawa is uh, getting a remake and getting some density around it, so it's going to be a pretty interesting mall that goes right through the center of, of Ottawa. Uh, one of the many pedestrian malls in London, this one in Shepherd Market in the Mayfair area. And then the one that astounded me most was the one on Nanjing Road in, in Shanghai. Um, this mall, this is the major street in Shanghai, and I spent lots of time in Shanghai uh, over the last year. I, I spent well, at least 40 or 50 trips to Shanghai, and this one amazed me because I hadn't been there for a year. And I go back, and this mall is built, and there's a little 
sign at the beginning, and it says uh, this mall uh, was approved by the Shanghai People's Consultative Committee in August of XYZ, and it opened in July a year later. Um, they demolished an enormous amount of commercial space to create this, and this, this pedestrian mall now runs for well over a kilometer in the most extensive real estate in the city. I had the same thing happened in Frankfurt. They took the major downtown uh, road and converted it to pedestrian use, and you see the same thing in, in any number of cities around the world, and it's, it really makes the livability and provides another very practical mode of getting around your feet. Uh, Mid-lock walks, breaking up the, the long stretches of, of space. Um, this is, uh, again, very old idea. Here's a famous one in Melbourne, built in 1859. Um, a beautiful one in Milan from 1865. Um, one in New York, uh, which has a mini park built into it. Um, this one goes back to 1816, so we're not talking path-breaking new ideas. Uh, the Burlington Arcade from 1819. And then this new mini street that they've developed in New York called Sixth and a Half Avenue, uh, which is between Sixth and Seventh. And it runs for six blocks, and the city bonuses developers who allow or encourage this mini street to go as a pedestrian street halfway between 6th and 7th Avenue. So they've been very, very successful uh, at creating weather protected spaces, uh, great gathering spaces, and they really have, have energized the city, and they are very, very busy. Um, pedestrian bridges, something, again, we have great opportunity to, to consider. Uh, we haven't done that to date. Um, here's one again. I'll take Calgary just to rub salt in our wound. Uh, another city we would never look up to. This is a rather expensive bridge built by Santiago Palatrava. Uh, this is a cheap bridge made out of wood, uh, built in Edmonton across the North Saskatchewan. Uh, here's a bridge over the Yarra in Melbourne, and one of the most famous and busiest pedestrian bridges over the Thames, the Millennium <coughs> Bridge connecting St. Paul's with uh, the Tate Modern on the south side of the river. So great opportunity to, again, uh, get better connections, give people an alternative mode of travel, and um, energize the place at the same time. Commuter ferries, we're blessed with being on the water. The beauty of commuter ferries is you don't pay for the right of way, you don't have to pay to maintain the right of way. Particularly here where the right of way never freezes. So we have a great opportunity to look seriously at this. And TransLink did a study a while ago, uh, well over a decade ago, and concluded it wasn't feasible. But when you're talking about an agency that has no capacity to do any real estate development, no way to encourage the use of these ferries, it's not surprising they look at the cost side and say, we're not going to do it. But New York has this incredible water taxi service. Uh, one of the most famous and active is Circular Quay in Sydney, which really is the center of, a, of an enormous transportation hub. We have a potential to do that. The city is looking at that. I hope TransLink can be coerced into having ferries come all the way in from Port Moody uh, to do that. Seattle has an active commuter ferry. And then the favorite of all is the first class uh, commuter ferry, the Star Ferry. First class is 250 Hong Kong to sit upstairs, and that's about 35 cents. Uh, those ferries are close to 100 years old, and they're still ticking along. And they add interest, and they add redundancy to the transportation system. So in Hong Kong, you can always get where you're going because there are four or five modes that duplicate each other and allow you to always get there on time, independent of weather or traffic conditions. And then finally, Auckland has, a, again, a very successful ferry system connecting the outer islands and some of the suburbs. Um, an oldie but good idea, uh, streetcars. We abandoned them. We had a streetcar in the old days uh, that went to uh, Chilliwack, 1900 from Fourth and Alma. And uh, one of the things that company did was generate electricity. Uh, the BC Electric Railway found it was much more profitable to sell electricity, turned into BC Hydro, and then got out of the trolley car business going out to Chilliwack. So again, we're not talking about a new idea. And in fact, much of the SkyTrain right away is old BC Electric right away, which we had been too slovenly to redirect for another use, so it was still there for transit. 
and the street cars are very comfortable. Uh, they're accessible to people with disabilities. They're very, very attractive, and they're very, very economical. So I hope we uh, consider these seriously. And of course, one place we have been a leader has been bicycles, and we should continue that as part of a broad transportation diversifying strategy. And uh, really busy places like New York have pioneered this as well. In fact, we're following much of New York's lead uh, with bikes right through Times Square. Times Square is now a pedestrian zone. And um, if they can cut one of the busiest intersections in New York from traffic, we certainly can do something similar. And then last, getting some innovation in land use and getting some flexibility. I really believe we've got to get back to much greater regard for physical planning. Back in the, in the 50s, 1956 and 1962, the National Interstate Defense Highway Acts, uh, which built the interstate highways in the United States, allocated 3% of the capital fund for planning. And that was the beginning of modern planning schools, where they got away from physical planning and urban design, and they got into urban analytics. And the planning schools uh, have shifted overwhelmingly into that realm. And the few places where you still find urban design tends to be in architecture schools. I think uh, it's a great art. It would tremendously encourage uh, interesting experiences for people in our city and really get the lived experience uh, down on the street plane and make it much more enjoyable. All the things we talk about, these pocket parks and mid-block cuts, that's all possible. We also need to look at some old ideas. Again, the theme here is these ideas are not new. Uh, row housing, it's very difficult to get row housing because you have to set it up as a strata instead of setting it up as a fee simple. Um, and I think that's so simple we should be able to do that. And it gives you a nice density bump. We also need some innovative building forms, and I'll, I'll go over some of the ideas there. And then, God forbid, go to no zoning zones, where somebody makes you an offer. And they come in. Remember, zoning only started here in the mid-1920s. So things that were built before 1924 or 5 in the city of Vancouver were built without zoning. The city seemed to have some coherence and work. Um, maybe it's worth experimenting with that. Uh, I'm a huge believer in multi-story warehouses and factories. I am a huge unbeliever in uh, a land reserve for industrial land. Uh, there's no reason why you can't go up and have mixed use with housing. And I'll show some pictures of much higher density warehouses than we have. And generally, really go for height and density at transit stations where we can dramatically increase supply and drop the total occupancy costs. So, I mean, here's some old ideas. This is on the, uh, now it's on the high line, but when I grew up in New York, these were active multi-story factory buildings with rail lines going right into them. Uh, they're still used in many cases as warehouses today, and um, some of them have converted to a residential as well. Uh, Michael Gellar will be pleased by this slide. Uh, some of the very innovative uses that are being made of shipping containers, and we have an example here as well with the Tira and it's uh, building on uh, Alexander, where they'd like to expand it. And then uh, my employer of uh, 40 years has pioneered the world's tallest wooden building, an 18-story wooden high-rise using uh, an innovative material wood, uh, and one that is sustainable. So there's a great opportunity to allow more of that. Uh, but it's difficult to get innovation here. I remember when I was with Warren on the Emily Carr uh, on the Great Northern Way uh, campus, that at the time BCIT wanted to experiment with sod roofs and do serious scientific study of the capability of using sod roofs. And they had trouble getting a building permit from the city of Vancouver. And that's just stupid. And if you can't allow somebody even to experiment in the small, uh, because it violates the current code, we're not going to make much progress in being an innovative uh, creator of land uses. Uh, the world's tallest logistics facility, which used to be known as a warehouse, is uh, owned in half by the Canada Pension Plan. This is a 5 million square foot, 25 story logistics facility in Hong Kong Harbor. Um, it's extremely successful. It's big enough so two 53 foot trailers can pass on the ramp at the same time. 
So you can do it when land values get there, and our land values isn't getting there, and I don't why we don't consider more of that. Here's a multi-story warehouse in Brazil, uh, a lower level warehouse, but still three stories and one that makes much better use of the land. I have endless numbers of really dramatically uh, uh, good looking buildings in Singapore, which you would have a hard time telling me by looking at the building that it was a factory, uh, because they spend a lot of time making them uh, very attractive and very functional. Uh, here's a mixed industrial residential development in Queens. Uh, in, in New York City. And here's an interesting little building in Surrey, or in Sydney, BC, where it's a factory at the bottom, a sail loft, and it's a residence at the top. So a small scale, very attractive. Again, uh, encouraging this sort of thing, I think, will go a long way to blurring this distinction between employment land and residential land, which our city is so strongly wedded to. Uh, Going back to townhouses, row houses, Georgian terraces, uh, over 200 years old, um, nothing wrong with that built form. And uh, as you can see, they can be quite dense. And here are newer variants in, in uh, the Netherlands. So again, it's hard to do that at Fee Simple in Vancouver, but it's well worth encouraging a, a more flexible ownership uh, and greater design of these kinds of land uses. So I have a, what I call the closing opening. And uh, I want to close, but open up uh, some other ideas. And the principal theme is that there's nothing that we really need to uh, develop that's radically new. Almost all of these great ideas have been tried elsewhere. They've been very successful. And all we need to do is adapt them to the Vancouver uh, lifestyle and streetscape for the whole region. And there are lots of opportunities to do that. Uh, in Vancouver, we have problems with very high land costs. In Surrey, there are problems with the blocks being too big. And their challenge is how do you whittle it down and make it uh, a more uh, densely populated, uh, walkable city. And in our case, we have a problem with land being very valuable. And how do we get a better mix there. I think it was uh, shockingly stupid that the city banned housing in the urban core uh, because they were afraid we were going to run out of office land, uh, which is absolutely impossible to just raise density. Uh, but that didn't occur to the folks at the time. Uh, so what I want to do is really say that the future is going to be built solidly on these oldies but goodies. So the palette of uh, ideas is, is well tried and true. Uh, and to the early professionals and, and students in the audience who've got great stuff to work with and great opportunities to put them to work here to make Vancouver a, a much more active, energized, enjoyable city uh, in the lived life, not in the planned life. Uh, and given all tools and new ones which are being developed, you know, I think it's, it's not just uh, easily uh, available to do, but it's readily doable because you're not taking any risks. New ideas were always risky. These aren't new ideas. So that's it. And I left time for questions. And as Gordon said, he was actually more brutal when he talked about it. He, the rule was, he said, not just students and young professionals, but he said, point blank, nobody over 40 is allowed to ask a question. <laughs> and he's prepared to look at your driver's license to make sure you don't violate that rule. So uh, the rest of the time is yours, and we've got time to answer questions and have a conversation, if you like. <clears throat> so. Uh, people with mics will come down the stairs. So first question. We can't see you, so yeah. you're, you're going to have to work harder. I see a hand. Okay. Perhaps not. No. We're webcasting, so some may not hear it, but they're not here, so. <laughs> okay, welcome back up. I'm good. I can see. Not that I can see much better this way. Great. Thank you so much for that um, provocative, uh, provocative. Um, talk. I, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, I'm a public health professional, so I 
specifically focus on the intersection between urban planning and um, population and public health. And um, two of the areas that I'm, I'm actually going to challenge a bit in your talk um, was one, I, I noticed you didn't speak quite to it, but um, was an urge to you know, build uh, higher and to build more density, particularly around transit you know, um, centers, which on the one hand completely makes sense. However, there is this emerging um, literature that indicates that living in high rises and high rise towers um, can be problematic in terms of sociability. And I'm sure many people here are probably familiar with the Vancouver Foundation's 2011 report that indicated that people living in high rise buildings in Vancouver actually report um, more loneliness, uh, you know, are unlikely to know their neighbors or to have done a simple. Um, you know, asked for a simple favor from their neighbor. So my concern is that we have done a lot of the towers and the density in Vancouver, and that we're, we're starting to see some of the social implications of that. And um, I, I think that, you know, for those of us who are early pro career professionals and moving forward in, in terms of building our city, I would urge caution in that regard, um, and that if we are going to build that kind of density and those types of forms, that we mitigate the potential social consequences. That was my one challenge, I guess. And the other is, um, you know, I'm curious about the waterfronts because my experiences of having traveled and, and been to other um, really magnificent cities um, with waterfronts, we have actually the most publicly available waterfront that I have seen the longest stretch of publicly accessible and available waterfront. And, my, I, you know, I, I mean, I think opening that up to retail and commercial, I wonder if we might lose some of that accessibility. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't want to see some of the amazing access that we have um, be, be lost in any way. Um, one of the things that, I, that I'll always remember is reading a few years ago that one of the things that urbanists fail to do is to provide spaces for people to be alone in reverence with nature. And that's actually one of the things that people can do in the city. Um, if you don't have access to you know, a car or whatever, you can still walk out somewhere in Stanley Park and be alone by the water in the city. I understand the, the isolation that's potentially existing in high-rise buildings. Uh, I mean, we lived in one, and part of the problem is the, the way the buildings have been designed. And I was talking to friends in Toronto who live in high-rises, and this is not the case there, the buildings they lived in. But the building we lived in, you had to have a fob that took you to your floor, or to the storage locker floor, or to where you stored your car. So if you wanted to visit friends, you had to go downstairs, uh, buzz them, and then they buzzed you up. Well, we can get around those things. And there are certainly ways to design the buildings differently. And there are ways to uh, encourage activities through design that I think can obviate a lot of that. And uh, certainly growing up in New York, I always envied the kids who lived in high-rise buildings because they had so many friends in the middle of winter. And there were no fobs in those days. So it really was a, a very big community. So I think, yes, that's happened. I don't think it's uh, an absolutely unavoidable outcome of the way we build. I think it's, uh, it's happened, but I think it's something that we know about and we can fix. As for the waterfronts, uh, I wasn't saying uh, take Stanley Park and turn it into a theme park. What I was saying is, when you have a beautiful site like Cold Harbor Park, it is hardly a place for contemplation. It's a big, busy park with cyclists and joggers going back and forth. So why not put some activity on the edges and get people uh, even more drawn to the place? The city has a mistaken belief that by parceling out uh, a cactus club in Stanley in, in English Bay, and another cactus club up on uh, the podium for the convention center, that this is energizing the waterfront. And I think you need some scale. And uh, to make it a destination place, uh, it's, it's really something which we lack. I mean, you would you'd never accuse Vancouver of being a terribly exciting place. 
It's got lots of activity, but exciting is never a word I've heard used. I've been in endless numbers of uh, conferences about ways to energize the city. And I think one of the things we can do is, is think of waterfront in a much more active way than we have in the past, because it's a natural place where everybody can have access and, uh, and enjoy it uh, at no cost. see you, but it's okay. I'm up here. Okay. Uh, I'm an intern architect, and I was really delighted to hear you uh, talk about the various architectural opportunities that we have here in our city, uh, not only in terms of typology, but also design. And I was curious if you had any uh, words of wisdom for uh, architects uh, in, the, in terms of, say, uh, beyond the traditional role of, of how an architect operates in the city responding to RFPs, any kind of additional roles that architects might be able to take on to realize some of these ideas you're talking about? Well, I, I remember walking right near that, that picture uh, of uh, Thames Walk. I think I, I took that four or five years ago. It's right near a, a design museum on the south side of the Thames. And I was walking through this design museum, and I got up to the just about to the top floor, and it was this big uh, word art uh, canvas by one of the, the designers who was featured in the museum and this person said creativity is breaking all the rules. I thought breaking some was pretty good but this, this seemed to be an absolute which is even more exciting. Uh, so I think breaking rules is, is pretty important and God knows we have enough rules here and coming up with alternatives I think is, you know, is, is very exciting. I do think that um, really starting to think more and more about what is the experience of the people in these buildings, uh, which is something architects can do. And when I look at buildings I like, um, uh, that I would say work, the buildings you get inside and you say, wow, this is really a nice building. I enjoy being in it. And it's easy to find my way around. And it's, it's enjoyable. And we've got a lot of buildings that aren't like that. And uh, we were at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, a couple of weeks ago. And there's a building that was really built um, reasonably unprepossessing when you look at it. But it's a great place to be worn. And uh, the person who designed it, Japanese architect, was thinking of what, what is the experience of the person in this building. So I think if that can come to the fore, it's going to add a lot to the livability of the city. And I think it's going to make architecture more satisfying. Than, than building something which is you know, consistent with some aesthetic, but really doesn't ground it in the lived experience and uh, making that lived experience as, as enjoyable as it can be for a whole variety of people. So I hope that's useful. If not, I'll go on. <laughs> Hi. Um, I also have, I guess, two questions. Um, one comment and one question. I'm wondering whether culture is, is ultimately one of the problems that we have in our city, where um, it seems like that there's an attitude, especially amongst people who have grown up here, that Vancouver is a quiet city. It's one where you can engage with nature. It's one where you know the outdoors is the first choice for activity rather than the city. And so the sort of neglect of the city stems from its sort of citizenry's concerns with the mountains and the oceans and the beaches, which are all very, very lovely. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. And then I guess a quick second point is, I'm wondering whether you have any thoughts on the role of grit in a city um, and sort of the sort of messiness and the vitality that we find in a lot of great cities around the world that seems to also be lacking in Vancouver, where there's sort of this cleanliness and this sort of slickness that we see in a lot of the city that appears to inhibit you know, that sort of uh, lived in experience that you can really get on a very micro scale in these other cities. Thanks. That second point is, is a great way to, I'll get back to it, to frame what I was really thinking about. Um, but with respect to the first, I'm not suggesting we take away the mountains or pave Burrard Inlet. I'm saying those things are there. Um, we celebrate them enough. Uh, I had a friend, an architect, um, who left Vancouver a couple of decades ago and he said jokingly, uh, what he'd like to do as a city planner, if he ever got the job, was require 70-story buildings 
at every street end, blocking the view. So you have to focus on what goes on inside the view. So the view and nature are givens. And in no way does being urban in the city in any way remove that. And may, in many ways, it may heighten the appreciation when you juxtapose this incredible uh, vast space we have uh, with uh, you know, a very vibrant city. And I think grit is very much uh, to, the, to the point. I, when I used to teach um, courses, uh, I taught one course we spent a lot of time looking at British new towns. And I used to, and this was in the, in the 70s and 80s when they were still reasonably new. And I said, the problem with them, and gets to your point, is until they get a couple of layers of graffiti, they're really not livable. There's somebody's idea of the way you should live. And they were very sterile, uh, very ideological and separating different modes of travel, and uh, having a town center where you could walk without being hit by a car. And all that was good stuff. But uh, they, they really squeezed the person into the urban form. And I think grid is exactly you know, what I was trying to get at, that kind of serendipity, spontaneity, uh, where you can pull a chair out on the street. And it doesn't have to be a designer chair. It's just a good old fashioned wooden chair. And nobody you know, throws a tantrum. So I think that kind of uh, naturalness is a large part of, of the cities. You look at the hottest places in New York, for example, Williamsburg and Brooklyn, where I, I didn't grow up in Williamsburg, I grew up in the center of Brooklyn. But that was an industrial slum when I was a kid. And uh, there were very, very few jobs there. And the people who used to who lived there lived there for the industrial jobs, the heavy industry that was there. The Brooklyn Navy Yard was one of the biggest Navy Yards in the United States. It was there. Uh, all that stuff disappeared, and it languished for a long time. I think one of the reasons it's so popular is that it's been a place very much like Granville Island to physically nice things. You can put all the nice things you want. We've tried, the, the most disastrous one has to be New Westminster, where they put in that absolutely stupid arcade on the waterfront, taking the only real value they had in downtown, which was the use of the river in Mount Baker, blocking it with a parkade, reasoning that Shopping centers were more successful because they had parking. No, they were more successful because they were more convenient. And the parking in New Westminster and beautifying uh, Columbia Street didn't do a damn thing to make that successful. Now it's coming alive because lots of people are moving in because it was cheap. So I think that idea of grit and um, kind of finding the way the city evolved and you can have contact with that is very important. And I think that's one of the real keys in Granville Island, why people like it so much is uh, the cement plant is very much a part of, and it's not there for show. The cement plant really is a very big and profitable cement plant. But people can see things built there, so I think you're right. Thanks for reframing what I said. Hi. Um, this is a comment from the back. I'm actually um, uh, sort of going to go under this other guise, which I think it's really important the slides illustrated, which is we need in the city a much more greater sense of social consciousness. So you can go through parts of um, Europe and Africa and into uh, South America, and people will understand the UN Milli Millennium Commission standards that have been set up for Millennium Cities, which is culture, education, sustainability, livability. There are 10 frameworks that exist, and almost anywhere you can go, those are actually part of the public's dialogue. And I think that's what's really difficult in the city, is that the awareness of how public space impacts how we live isn't really discussed. So that discussion needs to be much broad, more broadly framed so that it can help bring drivers not only in higher education, but also to City Hall. And so those are things that I think you know, the examples show, but we actually have to work much more on public dissemination to a certain extent. And likewise, I think it's really critical that cities also look, as we densify or as we change our um, city plan that there actually are competitions where people can, uh, young architects, designers, artists can get integrated into that. So we mentioned um, UK new towns. I'll speak to Scottish new towns. There was a number of times where artists and residents were engaged and actually helped change the social fabric of how the cities functioned. And that's also um, part of a cultural reframing 
that could be inherently embedded in Vancouver. And so even if you think of very early competitions like Great Northern Way, as this campus gets developed, you can go to the Glasgow School of Art. It was Macintosh's very, very first commission, and Macintosh is synonymous with Scotland as a key architect and artist. So these are the types of things that I think need to become um, more embedded in our lifestyle in Vancouver. It's not just looking at the urban plan, but making sure that architecture, design, art, culture are at the foreground of how we speak about the city and what we want to see happen within it. I, I absolutely agree with that. And in, in taking one step further, I find it absolutely unacceptable that kids, for example, go to school hungry. It's just not acceptable. And the fact that we haven't looked at, at education in a more holistic way, and that we you know, haven't looked at design in a more holistic way, the way you're talking about, I think it's, it's very important. It's a very different kind of engagement with the public than one we've had before. And public engagement is a very subtle thing. It's, um, you know, as I say continuously, democracy is getting your say, not getting your way. And being able to have people be heard, understanding that no matter who, how good their idea is, it may not be followed. But that there is a forum where people can get ideas out, and over time, good ideas will rise to the top, and people will see the fruits of their thinking and of this, this kind of discourse. I think that's terribly important, and we don't have much of that. And I would agree with that. And I think it's certainly a function that architects can do more of, and that uh, certainly the city can engage, not for a purpose, not for rezoning, but just generally to engage people in, in what kinds of city they would like without the idea of building a grand plan. Uh, I'm not a big proponent of grand plans. Uh, I like a whole bunch of smaller plans. And if you get lots of ideas, we can try lots of things in lots of different neighborhoods where they're culturally appropriate and where the, the people want to try these, these experiments. So I, I would agree with that entirely. Thanks. I think we'll, we'll take one more question and then uh, We'll begin to wrap up the evening. Is there one more? I can't. Yeah, uh, uh, a little bit, uh, maybe, uh, telling us uh, what you think about uh, how maybe the, the city of Vancouver could uh, uh, act and help to make it that. Uh, uh, this tremendous amount of creative people are in this city could uh, uh, maybe a little bit more um, adding to this uh, city um, viable life. Uh, do you have any idea? You mentioned a couple of ideas. Oh yeah. I, mean, I think that going forward we know that that's uh, the intellectual and economic future for cities as being cauldrons of creativity and ideas. And that's the cities that are good at that, are the cities that are going to be successful. And I think we, we've done some very good things. Uh, we mentioned the Great Northern Way <coughs> campus, which is owned by the four universities. And uh, when I was on the board with, with Warren in the early 2000s, the city had done a, a census of artists. And they found the greatest concentration of artists uh, both uh, visual and performing artists, was in this wedge between Kingsway, Maine, and uh, Great Northern Way out to Clark Drive. And we felt very strongly that part of what Great Northern Way campus had to be was it had to be a cauldron where we could get those people actively engaged in the campus activities and that the, the four universities were not going to do uh, a more traditional uh, wall around the university, but rather have it very permeable and have public spaces for both performing and visual artists. And I think there's been some success. I think we need to do a great deal more of that in the work that uh, I'm doing with uh, Michael Stevenson and, and a bunch of other people on Granville Island. That's front and center is how do we celebrate creativity and how do we give it a place where it can flourish and where people can appreciate uh, just how exciting creativity is, and come away watching creative people do things and you know, saying, aha, I never would have thought of that. That's really exciting. So I think celebrating that is clearly uh, a cultural value, which we have to a great extent in this city. And I think we have to uh, not formalize and institutionalize it so we kill it, 
but we have to recognize it and facilitate it. So, thanks. Great idea. Michael, thank you very, very much. <laughs> Provocative, challenging. I think everyone in this room tonight is going to look at our city and our region differently than we did before we came in tonight to listen to Michael. I think we're very grateful. I think it's safe to say Warren would have really enjoyed this evening. That's important. So thank you very, very much. We have something for you. And it's caught off the press. In fact, I believe it's being, uh, the release party for the book is on Monday night called Placemakers, Emperors, Kings, Entrepreneurs, A Brief History of Real Estate Development. And I'm really pleased to say that the author of this book, Herb Auerbach, is in the room. I'd like to acknowledge Herb and thank him very much if I could see him. There he is. Thank you very much, Herb. And thank you again, Michael. Uh, just a wonderful addition to the uh, Warren Gill Lecture Series. Thank you. Thank you.